Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on Group 2 Elements. Um, this is the Topic 10 video for the CIE, which is the Cambridge International um, Specification. So if you're studying the Cambridge um, uh, course, then this video is perfect for you. Obviously, we're going to look at areas of Group 2 Elements. Um, there is the full range of A-level videos on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. I'd massively appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button just to show your support. Um, but also, any videos that you see on here with the black backgrounds, these are just PowerPoint slides which, I'm, um, which I've created. Um, they're available to purchase via my test shop. Um, if you click on the link in the description box below, you can get a hold of them there. They're great value for money, great for supplementing your revision, your notes and your books and everything like that. So it's just electronic form that you can obviously take wherever you want. So let's crack on with this then. Um, so this is a, a, a relatively short topic, um, you know, compared to some of the other topics within the CIE bit. Also, a lot of the topics you'll probably see kind of... Um, merge within each other um you'll see that there's a bit of a kind of cross-referencing between the two and you'll probably find some of the equations on here may also fit with topic nine um so yeah there's a bit, little bit of some duplication but um it just puts it into context i suppose so obviously this topic is purely going to look at group two elements um and obviously group two elements form plus two ions when they react as you probably will have seen before so group two metals, they lose two electrons to form plus two ions. And all group two metals have an electron configuration that ends in S2. So obviously look at your subshells. So let's have a look. So there's beryllium and there's magnesium. So you can see this pattern here. Okay, so they all end in S2. But they also do form ions, as you can see on there. They form the kind of plus two ions. And so when you remove the electrons from the S, the 2S orbital, then you're left with these here. So as we go down the group, the atomic radius gets bigger. So it increases as we go down the group. And the reason for this is because we add extra shells to, to the atom. So obviously, because we're adding extra shells, then obviously the, the radius increases overall. So relatively straightforward, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, ionization energy. So you would have seen again bits of this in the previous um, previous topics, but this is specifically looking at uh, group two elements, um, and the first ionization energy decreases and reactivity increases as we go down group two. So, extra shells, obviously as we've seen before, are added as we go down group two. Um, and obviously this does have an impact in terms of ionization energy and this is because as we go down the group more shells means more shielding and so therefore that attractive force between the nucleus the positive nucleus and the outer electrons is obviously weakened as we go down the group so therefore it makes it easier to remove the electron from the outer shell um, and obviously that's why the ionization energy decreases as we go down obviously as you can see on that graph there so both of these obviously um the the fact that the outer electrons are further away from the um, um from the, uh, the the nucleus and the fact that there's more shielding obviously this makes it easier to lose that electron as we say so um, we do have, obviously, an increase in the number of protons as we go down the group. And you might think, well, hang on, does that not have an impact? But the, the shielding effect is so powerful, it overrides any increase in the number of protons in the nucleus. But normally, that, that might be something they might kind of throw in as a bit of a curveball and say, look, but the number of protons are actually increasing as we go down the group. Does this not mean that you've got an increased nuclear charge? It does but that kind of attractive force is, is just completely overwhelmed by the fact that you have more shielding. So just kind of be aware of that. Okay, so let's have a look at some kind of chemical reactions here. So group two elements, they react with water to form bases. Um, and obviously they react with water to form metal hydroxides. Now th there is a little bit of a quirk here as you'll kind of see later on with regards to these reactions. Um, but let's have a look at this first one first. So this is strontium. 
reacting with water and this will form strontium hydroxide and hydrogen gas so you get some fizzing you'll see some fizzing with this reaction so as we go down the group so as we go down group two the reactivity increases with water so there's the the reactions are much more vigorous there isn't any reaction with beryllium which is at the top so it's effectively inert and when it reacts with water and um, the atom obviously gets larger as we go down the group and so that electron is further away from the nucleus and so therefore it's much easier to remove that electron when it you know when it interacts with another atom and so therefore it's more reactive and obviously there's more shielding so remember when we're looking at chemical reactions the thing which allows a reaction to occur is the fact that electrons can be removed um, from an atom and if it's easier to remove an electron from an atom then it's likely to be more reactive so it's that distance from the nucleus and the shielding which again has an impact here so magnesium does react with water it's really slow though if you've ever seen magnesium ribbon and put it in water it doesn't really do a lot to be honest um it's an incredibly slow reaction so normally um magnesium um if you want a reaction from it is you heat it with steam um this produces a slightly different product though so instead of producing magnesium hydroxide you produce magnesium oxide instead so magnesium hydroxide is only formed when magnesium reacts with cold water Okay, so just that's the kind of slight quirk in this. Okay, so the um, group two elements also react with oxygen as well, and they form bases as a result. So um, reaction with oxygen to form metal oxides. So there's your first one. So this is magnesium reacting with oxygen to form MgO. Um, now the magnesium is burned with a really bright white flame and um, you shouldn't look at magnesium directly when it's burning in a Bunsen burner you should use your peripheral vision and kind of glance at it just through the corner of your eye because it will cause it can cause damage to your eye permanently um, if you stare at it directly um, they're, they're used in fireworks actually magnesium or oxides of magnesium and um, they give it that kind of sparkle that bright color so looking at some oxidation states on here, um, remember magnesium, um, and this is in group, um, sorry, this is topic six, if you're not familiar with this, when we look at oxidation states, but magnesium has um, an oxidation state of zero because it's an element, um, and then when it reacts with oxygen, it forms MgO. Now, the oxidation state of magnesium in MgO is plus two. Um, because obviously it's reacting with oxygen which is minus two so here you can see it's obviously been oxidized um, now the oxygen itself is being reduced so obviously this is an example um, of a redox reaction now group two oxides when you do form a group two oxides they are white solids to be honest a lot of chemistry a lot of powders in chemistry are white um, unless the transition metals may normally form colored uh, colored substances but um, yeah so group two oxides are white solids again if you look at magnesium when you burn it in a Bunsen burner you get this white powder that's left behind so you might you might have seen that okay so let's look at some group two oxides and what we can do with the oxides so we can react them oxides with water um, and we form bases with them so alkaline solutions like i say are formed so let's have a look at strontium oxide as an example so we take strontium oxide and react that with water we form strontium hydroxide which is the solution obviously that's formed um now we can obviously break that up into the ions that are formed so you get sr2 plus strontium 2 plus ion and the two oh and remember it's the oh minus ion that makes something um basic so that obviously that's the alkaline there that's um, the ion that's responsible for that property so oxides they react readily with water they make hydroxides and obviously they dissociate to form that oh minus ion um magnesium oxide reacts very slowly though um, and the hydroxide barely dissolves at all so obviously this, we picked strontium deliberately because obviously it's lower down in the group and it does um, allow obviously it does form that OH minus ion as well so they become more strongly alkaline as we go down the group and this is purely because the the hydroxides are actually more soluble in water and if they're more soluble that means they dissociate readily and you get plenty of these oh minus ions that are produced if you go towards this say the top end of the group like magnesium obviously it doesn't produce as many of these and that's obviously the the main feature of an of an alkaline or basic solution okay so let's have a look at some neutralization reactions then so we've looked at oxides 
dissolving in water. So now we're going to look at these oxides and reacting them with hydroxides. So they can neutralize acids, which is probably no surprise. Um, and an example of how oxides react with acids is here. So this is obviously calcium oxide reacting with hydrochloric acid, so HCl, and that will form your salt, which is calcium chloride, and water is produced. So this is your classic um, acid plus base gives salt plus water um, type of reaction. So let's have a look at some hydroxides. They follow the same rule, obviously. So calcium hydroxide reacting with HCl, that will form calcium chloride still and water. So the products are still the same. Obviously, the balancing is going to be slightly different. So oxides and hydroxides act as bases when they're reacting with acids, as you can see there. Okay, so let's have a look at some decomposition reactions. Um, so group two carbonates and nitrates, they can decompose upon heating. So this is effectively just heating them up. You've got a carbonate, a pile of carbonate, and a pile of nitrate. We just apply some heat to it, and what happens to that? So carbonates, they do break down into metal oxides and carbon dioxide. Normally, when you've got carbonates involved, you will produce carbon dioxide, so that's a bit of a clue. Um, and obviously, this occurs via thermal decomposition, so it's basically just heating the compound up. So is calcium carbonate. That's going to produce calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. Um, nitrates, so these are group 2 nitrates. These break down into metal oxides, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen. So you're getting three different products here. But again, a bit like with carbonates, where you form carbon dioxide with nitrates, you'll form nitrogen dioxide um, and again this is through thermal decomposition so here's the reaction here so you've got calcium nitrate um, which will form calcium oxide plus nitrogen dioxide plus oxygen so just be aware of these reactions um, obviously they're interchangeable depending on the group two element um, but um, yeah you've got to be aware of these so the carbonates and nitrates become more thermally stable as we go down group two. So in other words, it becomes more difficult to get them to decompose as we go down the group. Um, and the reason why is the carbonate or the carbonate nitrate ion has a large electron cloud that can be distorted when nearby positive um, group two metal ions are obviously bonded to it. So all group two metal ions, they all have that plus two charge, remember. Um, but they do become larger as we go down the group, obviously because you're adding that extra shell, aren't you? So the charge that that plus two ion has is actually spread out over a much larger area. And so that means the charge density is lower. So it's a bit like, imagine if you've got, um, to use an example, let's say you've got some toast, for example, um, and you have a fixed amount of butter on your knife. Now, if you had a small slice of toast or small slice of bread, sorry, which is toasted, fair enough, um, and you had the fixed amount of butter, then you could spread that butter quite evenly and nicely across the across the, the bread or the toast. If the toast or the bread was much larger, but you had the same amount of butter, which is a bit like, um, I suppose, the um, electron cloud, then you could still spread it, but it's spread a lot more thinly and it probably won't taste as nice. Um, so it's the same with this. So you've got group two, well, not quite the same, but it's the same concept. So you've got a group, group two element. The bigger the element, the more that charge has to be distributed across the atom. And so therefore the density of charge decreases. Now this does have an impact. So obviously magnesium two plus um, obviously magnesium being a smaller element has a high charge density and what this means is it distorts the electron cloud in the carbonate or the nitrate ions much more than the barium one which has a much lower charge density because it's bigger um, and obviously the less distortion you have the more stable the carbonate is okay so for example obviously you've got a lot more distortion here so this is your carbonate ion you see the electron cloud's been pulled or distorted away towards the mg2 plus because it's got a nice heavily uh, dense or high density charge in the ion whereas barium's a bit bigger it's spread out a little bit more and it doesn't distort the electron cloud as much in the carbonate so this is more stable because the distortion isn't as great okay so just hopefully that diagram kind of makes it a bit clearer anyway 
Okay, so let's look at some solubilities here. We're going to look at some various different group 2 compounds here. Um, but group 2 hydroxides and carbonates have opposite solubility as we go down the group. Okay, so let's have a look. So as a general rule, if the anion, that's your negative ion, if that has a double charge, they become less soluble as we go down the group. Okay, so this is because there's um, a decrease in the enthalpy of hydration of the metal. Basically, enthalpy of hydration, you'll kind of see a lot more of this in um, in year two, but it's effectively just where you um, you have a, basically water molecules can surround the metal ion on that. Don't worry too much about that. What really in year one, what you're mainly focusing on is the fact that it has a double charge and that as we go down the group, they become less soluble okay um if we look on the other side if they have a single charge such as hydroxides for example so group two hydroxides they actually become more soluble as we go down the group um, and again the lattice of dissociation uh, enthalpy decreases and this outweighs the enthalpy change of hydration on the metal ion so again this is really something you would probably use in well you will use in year two rather than year one but Again, what you need to be aware of for year one chemistry or AS chemistry is the fact that hydroxides, group two hydroxides, become more soluble as we go down the group. So the extra bit of info is if you're doing the full air level. Okay, so let's look at some uses finally. Um, so obviously group two compounds are used in everyday life as you would probably expect. Um, so the first one obviously is lime. So calcium hydroxide um, is also known as slacked lime as well. Um, and that's used to neutralize acidic soils. Really important for farmers. Obviously some crops will grow better in certain um, pHs of soil. And so therefore the farmer wants to try and utilize or maximize their crop yield. They'll make sure that the soil pH is perfect and they can spray um, calcium hydroxide, for example, slack lime onto the soil before they grow the crop. Uh, limestone, um, obviously calcium carbonate um, is used in construction material and buildings. So it can be used to make cement, as you can see on there, or some lovely stone cottages. Obviously, that's a, an example of limestone that's been used. So it's a, quite a useful um, building material as well. Okay, and that's it. I told you it was a short topic. Um, so like I say, please subscribe to my channel. The full range of CIA level videos are, are on Allery Chemistry. Um, please spread the word, tell your friends, etc. Um, these slides are available to purchase as well. I've grouped them up as part of the inorganic um, a, um, AS chemistry topic. So it's not just this one. There's other ones in there as well. But you can buy the full um, a level content as well via my test shop the link is in the description box as you would expect um but hope that was helpful that's it bye bye